Welcome to Hartford, everyone. It's been a great conference so far. Uh, welcome to Hacking Your Emotional API. I'm going to talk about emotions and how they can impact us as developers and ops people and people in technology in general. And I'm going to do a quick content warning here. I'm going to talk about um, divorce and the loss of a loved one. So if uh, things get a little too intense for you, please step out. I will not be offended. So my name is John Sowers. I've been coding for more than 20 years. And in addition to being a CTO and developer and founder, I spent many years helping people work through their most intense emotional traumas. And based on what I learned doing that, I've created a metaphor to describe how feelings work. So I'm going to walk you through that metaphor. I'm going to talk about why it's important to understand feelings on this level. And then I'm going to go through techniques that you can use to level up your skills in this area. But first, I'm going to start with a quote. <laughs> I think that's a pretty funny quote. And I think a lot of us can relate to it. But that sort of makes me ask the question, why do so few of us really feel like we understand our emotions? And I think part of that has to do with how we're raised. At most, we only get half the information we need. We get a lot of feedback telling us what not to do. Don't cry, don't make a scene, don't run, use your outside voice, all these things, right? But what we almost never get is help with what we should do. We don't get any information about what to do to stay emotionally healthy, to express our feelings in constructive and appropriate ways. Our parents probably didn't tell us this, mostly because they probably didn't know. And school is not going to help in this area. They will certainly punish you for handling your emotions improperly. But they don't give you any way of getting better at it. So each of us has to figure out, by trial and error, what's going to work. And some of us have only limited success. So I put this talk together because I want to help all of us get better in this area. This talk is built from my own experiences. It's one way to approach understanding your feelings, but it's not the only one. So if this model doesn't work for you, I hope that you can find a model that does. All right, let's talk about our emotional API. These are our core API endpoints. They handle all of our basic emotions, and they're hardwired in. But these endpoints don't get called directly. We have this layer of emotional middleware, uh, which is like all these mappings between things that happen to us and an emotional response. And this middleware is being built up over our entire lives. And these mappings can be pretty flexible, too. The person here on this slide is very different from the person represented on the earlier slide. And this is the simple case where you have one event triggering one feeling. But this middleware can actually have a lot of complexity to it. There can be chunks of code. Think of them like methods or like serverless functions that can cause huge amounts of traffic into that core API. So let's look at an example of the first item on this list, losing your job. The code for that might look like this. We can see 100 calls to the fear endpoint, 20 calls to the sadness endpoint. This is going to be a very, very strong emotional reaction to that event. And there's also some bad news. <laughs> it's a public API. And any person or event can call any of these endpoints at any time. But it's OK. It's really OK. Because by practicing some of the tools I'm going to talk about today, you can rewrite that middleware. You can refactor the methods and choose which response you're going to send in a given situation. And that's my metaphor. It's a framework for understanding and talking about feelings. And what I like about this model is it takes this big, squidgy, ill-defined mess of feelings and breaks it down into smaller sections that are easier to talk about. So I'll segue into the next section with another quote. Now, I don't really enjoy working with emotions. You probably don't either. And unfortunately, I can't change that. So I want to illustrate why it's important to go through the discomfort of this emotional work. 
And I'm gonna talk about some of the surprising and not so surprising ways that unhandled emotions are affecting us. I'm gonna start with a single unpleasant truth. No matter how much you want to, you can't actually avoid your feelings. Everyone loves to think that they can, but they've done studies on people when they were asking them specifically to repress a negative emotional reaction to something. And when we look at their nervous system, we can see that while the subjects of the test felt like they were keeping it together pretty well, if you look at their nervous system, the effect of that negative feeling is remains or intensifies. So emotions are unavoidable. Let's look at how they affect our ability to write code when it's just us sitting down in front of an editor. So unprocessed feelings make us feel powerless. And the powerlessness I'm talking about is the sense of not being in control of your life or your career or not being able to handle whatever's gonna come at you. You know, think about the last time you had some big emotional upheaval. At that time, you probably really didn't feel like you were in control of your life. And studies have looked at the impact of powerlessness on cognition. They've highlighted specific deficits that arise in executive function. Now, executive function is our ability to control our attention, to plan, organize, remember details, and solve problems. And I don't know about you, but it sounds like a lot of what I spend my day doing. And so when it's impeded, we lose our ability to focus deeply in our code, to find bugs, design new complicated systems. And those same studies show that it affects our short-term memory as well. Think about how much of the system you can hold in your head as you're trying to trace through and figure out where the problem actually lies. And we can't handle stressful situations either. Think about the last production fire you were part of, or a demo with executives, or even just crunch time before a release. Do you want the stress of that situation to affect you this much or this much? Conversely, when you have good framework for handling your emotions, you get back that sense of control. You reverse all the problems I just mentioned. When children were trained in techniques of emotional hygiene, they showed improvements in behavior, as you would expect, but they also showed improvements in academic achievement. Their grades improved. And when similar training was done in adults, it showed improvements in long-term physical health. Think about that. When your feelings work better, your body works better. And whether it's an open source project, a large corporate team, or a two-person startup, thriving in a diverse community requires us to develop our skills in empathy, understanding, and communication. And being a good developer isn't just about slinging code or spinning up new servers. We're part of a community. That's what this conference is about. In many ways, the non-coding aspects of our lives are more important than the coding or deployment or the rest of what we do when we're sitting typing. So now let's look at how feelings are impacting you in a group. One of the interesting things about doing the work to develop an understanding of your own emotional process is that it get, it, that knowledge translates perfectly into understanding other people. When you've done that work on yourself, suddenly what someone else is going through makes a lot of sense to you. And in his book, Emotional Intelligence, Daniel Goleman talks about the research he's done showing that emotional intelligence is correlated with career advancement. Put simply, you'll get better jobs and you'll be promoted faster when you have these skills. So when we regain that sense of power that I talked about earlier, we become less self-centered and our ability to empathize is enhanced. Now, we rarely intend to cause harm with the words we say or some of our actions, but it can happen by accident very easily. When we understand other people's emotional reactions, the empathy helps us predict how our words and actions are gonna come across so we can easily avoid inadvertent harm. This quote from a developer at Valve sums things up pretty well. So 
So let's get into some detailed scenarios that illustrate how some of these things play out. From my perspective, you're a better developer, you're a better assist admin, you're develop better SRE if your cognition isn't affected by your emotions. If you have the confidence to express your ideas and advocate for them, rather than staying quiet because you think no one wants to hear from you. If your comments are full of empathy and understanding, and you don't make your teammates dread getting your input. If you're not distracted by difficult situations outside of work. If you can deal with your coworkers that are pushing your buttons so that your work performance isn't impacted by somebody else who doesn't have their act together. If you can fight your imposter syndrome, or more importantly, realize when you're being gaslighted see a situation clearly enough to realize that you are being treated unfairly. If you can keep your cool during a job interview, if you can be fired without doing something you're gonna regret. And let's talk about leadership for a minute. These skills are critical for managing and mentoring a team. They're not just developers or sysadmins, they're also people. And being able to understand their emotional needs makes you a more effective manager. A while back, Frontside.io posted an article about what they look for in a senior developer. You can see they broke it down into three different areas. But notice that everything in the diagram has a huge emotional intelligence component to it. Even the technical capability circle talks about behavior, not whether you've got 10 years of Java or Linux or whatever. Curiosity, discipline, fearlessness, these are emotional skills. So those are some of the reasons why we want to do work on our emotions. Now I'm gonna tell you about some of my emotional toolkits in the hopes that you will be able to use these tools yourself. I've broken down into four levels of difficulty. Level one are new ways to think about feelings. Level two are techniques that you can use on your own to develop some fluency and start understanding them. Level three are applying the level two techniques with someone else. This is often a bit more difficult for people. They evolve being honest and vulnerable with somebody else. And level four is the master level and the most powerful, but it's also the scariest because it involves being open and vulnerable in a group of people. We'll start with the easy stuff in level one. Changing the way you think about feelings can actually have a big impact because we don't have any formal education in this. We collect a lot of misconceptions. So I'm going to clear some of those up and explain how feelings work. The first thing to realize is that your emotional reactions are not set in stone. They're legacy code that's built up over your lifetime, and it can be refactored. And also, we get to decide where and when we process our feelings. We have a great background job queue available to us that we can use whenever we want. In fact, this is the tool that we're taught to use as children when you're having a meltdown at the store and it's like, don't do that now. Put that on the queue and worry about it later. But the problem is a queue isn't very useful if you never pop jobs back off of it and run them. And so for most of us, this queue has just been growing our entire lives. People get caught up in what feelings mean about them when they have them. But having a feeling, anytime, any feeling, does not mean anything about you. Feelings are personal and they can mean a lot to you, but they don't define you in any way. If you're feeling angry, it doesn't mean that you're an angry person. It doesn't mean that you can't control yourself or that you're a monster. But people get really worried about that. Strong emotions like anger, though, they, they can be scary because it feels like we might lose control. Now, let's look at what I just described. You're now having a feeling about having a feeling. And this is actually pretty common. And it can go pretty deep, actually. So imagine, as a child, you get angry at your mother, but that was something that was never allowed. Let's say maybe you've done some work and you realize that that dynamic is in place, but you haven't really broken out of it. So when you feel angry at her, suddenly you're feeling ashamed of being angry at her. But you're also aware that there's this weird, di like unhelpful dynamic, 
And so maybe you feel disgust at the fact that you're feeling shame about the anger that you're feeling. So you can have all these multiple intertwined conflicting feelings about a single situation. And people always wanna know like, well, which is the real feeling? And the answer is all of them. They're all the real feeling. They all have to be dealt with on their own. And the feelings that arise in the situation don't have to make sense. Think about losing your job example from earlier. You can react to that with fear, with grief, with anger, with relief. We're all four of those together. There's no one thing that you should feel in that situation. And that goes for all situations. Now, unprocessed emotions are like emotional debt. Just like buggy, hacky, complicated systems are technical debt. And just like tech debt code, emotional debt hangs around and makes things harder and interferes with everything you're trying to get done in the present day. One last piece. Many people have had the experience of a feeling coming on and feeling like it's so intense that it's just gonna take over and it's never gonna end. That there's just like, if I start yelling, I will never stop yelling. If I feel this sadness, I will never stop crying. But it's not gonna happen. Our bodies just don't work that way. Our brains don't work that way. Experts tell us that feelings really only last about 20 minutes. And this has been verified with my own experience countless times. So that's level one. Level two are, are things that you can do on your own, both to build an understanding of yourself and your feelings, and to start having direct experience with some of the concepts from level one. So feelings begin in your physical body. They're not just mental processes. And all they want to do is move out. That's it. So it's like when you've had too much coffee, right? Your body just wants to move. That's just compelled to do that. In fact, sometimes the first sign of an emotional reaction to something is in your body somewhere. Maybe your shoulders are crunched up or you're feeling something in the pit of your stomach. You may not even know what the feeling is, but it's in there in your body. So moving your body can help bring those things out and help you deal with them. So that can get you started, but in order to make real progress, you still have to acknowledge the feeling, you have to know what it is, and you have to feel it. You can't just go for a run and hope it goes away. So, a quick aside. You may have heard of rubber duck debugging, and if you haven't, I'll give you a quick rundown. So, have you ever noticed that when you've been banging your head against a problem for a couple of hours, you get really frustrated and eventually get it from your desk, you over to a coworker and you say, I've got this problem, and you start explaining it. And halfway through your explanation, before they've said anything ever, at, at all, boom, suddenly you have the insight into the solution. This happens so frequently that a hack has been developed to short circuit this process a little bit. You can keep a little rubber duck or a cat or a dog on your desk, and before you get to that point of asking someone else, you explain the problem to them as if it was a coworker. And chances are that'll be enough to trigger the same burst of insight. We'll get back to this in just a moment. So being aware of your emotions, talking about them, naming them is really helpful. And there, here are some tips for talking about feelings. Now you may have noticed that this is the section for things that you do on your own. Let me explain. This is where the rubber duck comes in because the same hack works with feelings as it does with technical problems. You can s explain them verbally to nobody. Just saying the words out loud can often be enough to bring you some insight to maybe suddenly realize what it is you're feeling. Think of it as a process of verbally exploring the feeling space, like try on this word, try on that word. Oh, that's it, that's what I'm feeling right now. And it can be hard to find the right word though because we don't have a lot of practice with this. So don't worry about picking just the right word. One of the keys is to try on a bunch of different words and see which one fits. This feel wheel can help suggest words to you. It was developed by Dr. Gloria Wilcox. It's not exhaustive, and you may not even agree with how some of the feelings are broken down in the hierarchy, but it's a great way to just get started finding the right word. 
Come see me after the talk or the rest of the conference. I've got a whole stack of these. I'd love to give you a copy. And the language we use when we're talking about a feeling is really important. When you describe a feeling, you say, I feel angry. I feel sad. You don't say, I am angry. It's a subtle difference in wording, but the meaning of it literally is very, very different. I feel sad says, I am currently having this feeling and I know it's going to pass. I am sad says, sadness defines me. Now, it's a little bit hyperbolic, but I think the underlying truth is there. So it's helpful to make the switch, even in ca casual conversation. So talking through a feeling is basically like calling your emotional API endpoints over and over in a safe space. And anything you do over and over again, you get better at. You start to get familiar with what it feels like to you to feel certain things. I suggest doing it on a regular basis, maybe a weekly emotional retrospective, like a sprint retro. We can just go back on the week and say, huh, Tuesday, a little depressed. Wednesday, so angry. Thursday was awesome. So you can do it as simple as that. Just name the things that happen, name the feelings. Or you can really, really dive into them, feel them, try and get to sort of the root. And taking the time to practice this on a everyday feelings, things that happen that aren't huge and catastrophic, will make it much, much easier when the big things happen. Now, you can develop a lot of skill and insight working on your own, as I've just described. But things get much, much more powerful when another person is involved. So in addition to helping process your own feelings, talking to others with them strengthens relationships. It makes them feel trusted and included, and it increases their trust in you. And this, you could do something as simple as sharing your emotional retro with someone. But emotional sharing isn't always helpful in all situations. Imagine you're angry that a coworker got credit for an idea you proposed. It makes you angry. What you need to do is feel that anger first. Realize what it is you're angry about and what the resolution is. Clear out that feeling, express it away from everybody else. Once you know what the resolution is and who to talk to about it, you go talk to them. You say, this thing made me angry. But you don't have to be angry when you're telling them this. And in fact, it's often counterproductive because it's gonna put them in a defensive state and then the conversation is gonna be about the feelings that are happening right then, not about the resolution going forward. And sometimes you need to bring in a consultant. There continues to be this judgment that seeking therapy means you can't handle your life, or that it's only for big you know, psychological, pharmacological problems. But working with a therapist should have no more stigma than hiring a consultant to architect your next integration. Having a subject matter expert on hand to help you get unstuck, to point you to a solution you may have missed, is really powerful. You'll be able to see your blind spots and notice patterns that you can't see for yourself. Now, for most of you, the thought of bearing your deepest emotions in a group of people is terrifying. And it was for me un until I did it. But once I got there, I realized how powerful it can be. So at the urging of someone I trusted years ago, I went to a workshop called Purpose, Passion, Peace. P3 for short. And there I was able to find a space that was safe enough for me to finally experience emotions that I'd been avoiding for almost my entire life. And I went back to volunteer every weekend, several times a year over the years. Eventually I was supervising the workshops and helping other people go through the same process I had gone through. And I don't have any psychology training, but this vast amount of direct experience with my own process and with other people going through that same process taught me so much. So I'm going to talk about my experience with sadness in the context of P3. This simple series of API calls describes a big part of my early life. Each one of these hits was devastating. And they all multiplied together. You'll see there are different versions of the API for different ages, and we'll see how that plays out in just a minute. 
So when I was five, my parents divorced. And I didn't really know how to process that. I just had feelings all over the place, fear and sadness and blame. And I didn't really know what to do with them, so they just sort of stuck around. And then I was eight, and I found out my father had cancer. And I felt those same feelings of loss and anger and grief and all these things swirling. And they triggered those earlier feelings that were still there, that were still swirling around and then multiplied together. These older feelings are more primal, harder to process. They're from years ago. And then when I was 17, he died. And again, the same feelings came up again, more intense this time. Loss, fear, anger, grief, all of it. Faced with all of this unprocessed emotion, I tried desperately to shut it down. The magnitude of the feeling was completely overwhelming. I held on for dear life and hoped that it would blow over. It did not blow over. 15 years later, it's a regular Thursday release, and I let a few bugs slip through. We didn't have a QA department, I was testing it. These were bugs I had written. Now, nobody wants to release bugs to production, but maybe it's not the end of the world if the CSS is a little wonky at the bottom of the FAQ. But for me, it felt like panic, panic, because this was my father leaving all over again. Boss daddy is gonna be mad at me. And so the highlighted lines here are code that I wrote when I was five. When my father left, that was the only reaction I could come up with. So, have any of you written code when you were five? Was it really good code? <laughs> Maybe. But I was reacting to something happening to my adult self with code written by a child. And that's what these old unresolved feelings do to us. They trap a part of ourselves at the developmental stage we were at when the trauma happened, so that any time these feelings come up again, they're handled by the most primitive and damaged parts of ourselves. And this is what I'm talking about when I talk about emotional debt. These things stick around and affect our daily life. So I did what you do with sadness. Once it was safe in an environment like P3, I cried. I cried and I cried multiple times, deeply until my stomach muscles hurt over years. But as I did that work, as I finally really felt those feelings, it slowly went away. And, over, and of now, that grief and sadness is gone. And I worked with all the other things. I worked, sent the sadness out, and then I sent the anger out, and then I sent the grief, and then the shame, all of them. So if you remember this slide, there are a lot of feelings happening. So I worked through each one in turn. You can't do them all at once. Focus on the sadness first, then on the grief, then the next one. Once I, once I was finished, I refactored that endpoint. Here's a diff. Now, of course, if my father died now, I would feel a lot of sadness and grief. But I wouldn't be damaged for the next 20 years by this process. I'm not running that outdated code anymore. And you like this. Sometimes you can completely wipe out a whole endpoint. If you remember that buggy release from earlier, this is what they look like now. It's basically a no-op. So that was some of my baggage. And you've heard a little bit about how that affected my life. And I'd like you to think a little bit about what some of your baggage might be. What are you bringing to your adult relationships, both at work and at home, that makes you react to things like a 10-year-old or a 5-year-old or a 15-year-old? And that's my toolbox. Every one of these tools is just a hack to get you to one place. Feeling a feeling. Not stopping it, not denying it, not analyzing it, not indulging it, just feeling it, because that's really all that needs to happen. And since forever these skills have been called soft skills, and I just bristle whenever I hear that word, because these things are incredibly difficult to develop. It takes a lot of time to develop these things far longer than it takes to learn C or Java or Docker or anything. And that's why I'm here speaking, because I'm hoping that this framework will help you get there faster. 
And as I start wrapping up, I want to talk briefly about next steps. So, you know when you read an article about best practices and you get really excited, like, oh, this is so cool, it's going to be all efficient and well-organized. You, you charge down to your editor and you sit down, you really want to make those changes. And then you give up in about five minutes because you realize that the inertia of your massive code base or system is too big to make any sort of substantial change in a short amount of time. That's how it's going to go with your emotional work. So don't try and do everything in all the levels that I've talked about. Just pick one thing, one thing that resonates with you that you can take home with you and practice every day. Just keep it in mind. Think about it. Think how, see if it affects the way you're interacting with people. And then once you feel like that's integrated, watch a video. There are a bunch of them available online or use your notes and try the next thing. And by that piece by piece action, we slowly make things better. So, your relationships with everyone, with yourself, with your coworkers, with your family, loved ones, they all start with you. Using the tools I've talked about, you get to decide how you respond to things, to be more present, more authentic, more capable in all of your relationships. Now, everyone you know is affected by how good you are in your relationships. And getting 10% better at any of this isn't just you getting better. It's 100 of your relationships getting better. That's 1,000% improvement in the quality of your life. So the impact here can be really big. OK, let's everyone take a big, slow breath. Thank you so much. It's been wonderful talking to you here today. I have got plenty of field wheels. Please come by and stop and talk about this, get some of this. Maybe I'll be able to get into one of the open spaces later and we can talk more. It'd be great. Um, I'll update the URL on the slide for and tweet out the latest slides for this. Uh, follow me on Twitter. And if you're interested in references where I got some of this information, take a snap shot of this and you'll have all of it. Thank you so much.